I'm going to ask if all of you would turn in your Bibles uh, to Matthew chapter 9, verse 36. Matthew chapter 9, verse 36. If you don't have a Bible, there might be one next to you, uh, and also these words will be on the screen behind me. This is the words of Matthew. And when he saw the crowds, talking about Christ, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Uh, This morning, I want to talk about compassion and and how it's revealed in Scripture. I want to talk about the compassion of Christ and the compassion that you and I are called to emulate as followers of Christ. And so I'm using this verse as a launching point. We're not going to exegete this verse entirely But I wanted to draw our attention to it uh, because the great Charles Spurgeon, many of you are familiar with Charles Spurgeon, the prince of preachers in the 1800s, said that if you were to summarize all of Christ's dealings with humanity, it must be summarized in this, that he was moved with compassion. And for me, these words have sunk in deep this week, and I want that to sink in deep in your hearts as well, because the tendency that we can have as we read through the Gospels is to just kind of glance over that without letting the gravity of that hit our hearts, without letting it sink deep into our soul. And so what's being communicated here when we look at the entire Bible is that when Christ who is the lamb who was slain before the foundations of the world, knowing in his infinite wisdom that his creation, that we, humanity, would fail to live up to the glory that we were called to, made a covenant with the Father, a covenant with the Spirit, to come and to seek and to save that which was lost before there was any creation. He is the lamb who was slain, who was compassionate for us from before the foundations of the world. And so when he in his perfection steps into time, steps into our space, he looks out into crowds just like us gathered here this morning. And and with his grace and with truth, he looks out. And what this passage doesn't say is that he looks out and sees our mess and is absolutely disgusted with us. That he looks at us and says, I can't believe you did that. That he looks out even to his own people who he gave his ordinances and his commands and say, hey, you knew better. And so because you knew better, I'm out. He's not looking out into the crowds with, with anger in this text. He's not looking out with further condemnation and shame. And this morning, he's not looking into our hearts and the depths of our own darkness and condemning us, but looking at us with compassion. And so... What is the Bible communicating to us when it says that he was compassionate towards us? It's really interesting because a lot of scholars believe uh, that the term compassion that was really coined by the New Testament authors, it it said that they had to somewhat invent this word because there's nothing else quite like it in the language of the day. And so when we look at this word compassion in Scripture, we see the Latin root word pati, P-A-T-I, which means to suffer. And when we look at the prefix that comes before it, com, C-O-M, that word means with or together with. And so compassion, as we see it in Scripture, literally means to suffer with. And in in some shape or form, this might remind us of empathy. Empathy. Right? So we have sympathy, we, we can recognize the hurt out into the world, but then empathy takes us a little bit further, and then we can actually feel that pain within us. But compassion goes a step further than empathy, and compassion is moved to take action. And that's what the Gospels are telling us Christ does for us. I hijacked this completely from Compassion's website this week because I thought they said it beautifully. They say that the component of action is what separates compassion from empathy, sympathy, pity, concern, condolence, sensitivity, tenderness, commiseration, or any other compassion synonym. It is that action point that that compassion is talking about. 
The other thing that's interesting when we look into scriptures is that this word carries with it something even further than that. And the Hebrews talked about this a bit with love and compassion. It's talking and pointing to the visceral region. It's talking about our innards. So if you've, if you've ever suffered a heartache, you feel that deep down within. That's why we communicate things like, I felt my heart sink to the pit of my stomach. If you've ever in, uh, experienced anxiety, and we all have, or, or nervousness, maybe for a job interview or circumstance or something going on in your life, it hunches you over. You feel that deep-seated, even physical pain within you. And that's also what the Bible is communicating with regards to compassion. Author Frederick Buckner says this. He says, compassion is sometimes the fatal capacity for feeling what it is like to live inside someone else's pain. It is the knowledge that there can never really be any peace and joy for me until there is peace and joy finally for you too. Compassion sees suffering, sees hurt, is so moved deeply within that we cannot just shut off and then turn our attention to something else, which I want to talk about briefly. We're prone to do in this smartphone generation. We hear things like mass shootings that have happened in the last few days in Maine, and we might be moved a little bit, but quickly our attention is turned to something else before we really let the gravity of these things sink into our hearts. Cause us to mourn even with those who are a thousand miles away. Cause us to yearn for the return of Christ where he will restore all things. Charles Spurgeon, who I mentioned earlier, I love going to Spurgeon because so many times I have like my 10th baseball reference and I go to him on a text like this to see what he might have to say and he's just painting all these beautiful words, bringing creation into that language and so I'm always disappointed with myself. But he talks about what a marvel it must have been for the disciples of this time to see the incarnate Son of God looking out into a crowd, feeling a all-consuming compassion. And you and I might experience compassion to some degree, but I would argue probably nothing near the compassion that Christ felt for our own sin, shame, and brokenness. He talks about what a sight it must have been to see the Son of God looking into the crowd, perhaps even hunched over with agony on his face, gazing out, his eyes piercing into the crowd and tears welling up. Like, what a sight that must have been. And, and I have a question this morning. When's the last time you've contemplated Christ's compassion towards you? Remembering what he's done for you. Contemplating his grace and his mercy towards you. As we look into the filth of our heart, the darkness of our minds, the things that so easily entangle us, the things that we struggle with, that Christ is moved with pity. And so beyond that, beyond the crowds, beyond the masses, one of the most remarkable things is that the entire life, the entire ministry, and even the death of Christ all emulated and oozed compassion. And I'll give a few examples some of my favorites. After a long day of ministry, Christ casting out what seemed to be thousands of demons, healing thousands of people with their sicknesses, infirmities, blindness healed, leprosy healed. It's time to kind of retreat back. He's invited into Simon Peter's home where they might have some ease after doing hard work, dealing with people all day. Like, I'm an introvert, man. I need to revert back sometimes. Enjoy a warm meal, decompress. And so he's invited into that setting. And as he walks into the home, Christ with his eyes who always are looking out compassionately, he couldn't help but notice, hey, Peter, what's going on with your mother-in-law? Jesus, that's okay. Like, it's time to rest, man. She's just fever. She's going to be okay. No, I, I must to work. And it was not too much for him. Like, I, I'm so moved by that because when I want to retreat, when I think I've done enough, man, I want to lean into the grace of God to go that extra mile. 
And husbands, we need to be reminded to go before the Lord and pray for grace, pray for strength, to go that extra mile, to do that extra thing. Take that diaper change at three in the morning that I should have done this week. At another point in time, in Christ's ministry, he sees a widow weeping on the streets. Not because of the loss of her husband this time, but because of the loss of her son. He sees her in pain and agony, and he's moved with compassion. But he doesn't just meet spiritual needs. He also steps into action to meet physical needs as well, knowing that no one could be more socially vulnerable than a widow who has now lost her son. So he steps into action and doesn't go to the woman. He goes to the son who's being carried by pallbearers. And I've been a pallbearer before, but I've never seen anything like this. He goes up to the son and says, bro, get up and walk. Your mom needs you. He's healed, he's raised from the dead, and he's restored to his mother. That would have changed me forever if I witnessed that. That's Christ meeting physical needs as well. Blind Bartimaeus in Scripture also had a friend with him. So these two blind men are in the city. Jesus is entering in, and everybody's in an uproar. Everybody wants to put their best light on for this coming Christ who could be the Messiah. And these beggars, these, these stinky beggars that the world is saying, shut up. Stay in your place. You're the scum of this city. We would rather hide you. So stop before he sees you. And they continue to cry out, son of David, have mercy on me. Son of David, have mercy on me. And the remarkable thing about this story is that when the city's in an uproar, with all this commotion, Christ's attention is stopped and arrested by two blind beggars. He steps into action. When everyone's pointing at them, you made this decision. You put yourself there. You knew better. This is your fault. Christ not only comes in and says, hey, here's a few bucks. Here's a 50. The remarkable thing for me in this is that he steps in and becomes their servant. He looks at them and says, what would you have me do for you? That's compassion. That's service. That's sacrificial living. And even at his own execution, Christ's compassion is emulating off of him because he went to his scourging without a friend by his side. He knows the feeling of being abandoned. He went to his death without any regard for himself because he didn't even have a tomb to call his own. In a culture that reverenced right burial, he had no regard for himself. This is compassion. And when I contemplate that, I think, man, have I rarely felt true compassion. Concern, interest in things at times, but man, I wanna feel the heart of God that is moved and compelled into action. And so for us, who profess Christ, who claim to be in him, I think it's only fitting and right that if this chief characteristic of our Savior is that he was compassionate, then should it not be the chief characteristic in our life? Should not our family members, should not our neighbors, our coworkers, our community around us, should they not look upon us and be able to say the same? They may say a lot of great things, but are they willing to say that person that man, that woman, she is a compassionate person. Christ says in Matthew 10, 24 through 25, a disciple is not above his teacher nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If we are in Christ, then it should equal transformed living. That's what the power of the gospel does. It brings transformation. That's why Paul says in 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 4, praise be to God, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us 
and all of our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort that we ourselves received from God. If we've been given grace, mercy, and compassion, it's to transform our lives so that we would reflect God in doing the same. And that's what we're called to, C3. That's the great calling on our lives, is to reflect Christ in all things, in obedience to Him. And before I ask Jim to come up, I was thinking this week uh, of, of one unique challenge that we face in 2023. Because if we look at the technological advances and the amazing comforts that we're thankful for, but that we enjoy, that is a complete anomaly to the rest of human history, we have to be warned. I think it's important for us, for me, to be warned of certain hurdles that we might face because there is, if you look into society, there is an erosion in the human capacity to feel empathy and to feel compassion. And I would take that further. I think there's an erosion in our human capacity to be self-reflective. And so sociologist, sociologist Sherry Turkle has a book called Reclaiming Conversation. And she says this in a beautiful way. She's a very smart woman. She says, our rapturous submission to digital technology has led to an atrophying of human capacities like empathy and self-reflection. When you speak to a person in person, you're forced to recognize their full human reality, which is where empathy begins. A recent study shows a steep decline in empathy as measured by standard psychological tests among college students of the smartphone generation. And conversation carries the risk of boredom, the condition that smartphones have taught us to most fear, which is also the condition in which patience and, and imagination develop. Essentially, what she's saying here is that if you and I were to look, Sunday evening news is perhaps the most depressing hour in the week. And it's just story after story after story. And the remarkable thing is it's just our local news. Like it's just a 30-mile radius. And it's boom, 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 the next story, the next story, the next story. But then we can go on to something ridiculous like a squirrel on skis and just kind of get moved. And so we hear about five dead in this shooting, but now we're looking at... Uh, Chippy the squirrel, and, and, and so there's no time to mourn. There's no time for the severity of the brokenness around us to sink in. And it's the same thing with our social media. We can use it for good, but then a couple of scrolls later, and our mind is just distracted. And, and don't get this wrong, news media wants to get you information, but they also know you have a short attention span. And so with all of the technological advances, with all of the beautiful things that we can now enjoy with our smartphones, I think there is a warning to be sure that we're not giving ourselves to them to the point where we're losing our faculty to think deep, to contemplate the brokenness around us. And to let that sink in in prayer, to be moved into action. That's all I have for us uh, this morning. At this point, I'd like to invite our very own Jim Cohn uh, to the stage. Uh, I just want to brag on Jim for a second or two. I got to know him a little bit during my interview uh, process where his heart uh, for people uh, really emulated off of him. But getting to know you, Jim, in the last six months, uh, there's two main things uh, that I am so amazed by. And one, as an elder, he loves the body so well. Like, I, I love watching his passion for each and every one of you, his heart's desire for your good and then also working with you with regards to things in the, in the missions field, his love for the broken, his love for the lost, his love for the world around us, for the needy. So Jim, I'm uh, thankful to serve with you. I'm excited to hear what you have to share. Give it up for Jim, guys. Thank you, Robbie. That's a pretty tough act to follow. Um, just so, just, just so your expectations are set right. I mean, just, I don't want you to think that I'm going to be able to continue with that kind of, you know, momentum. <clears throat> so, good morning, church. We, uh, as uh, Robbie mentioned, 
uh, welcome to our eighth Compassion Sunday here at C3. And anytime I get to talk about compassion, I get excited, uh, a little emotional. Um, it's, a, it's a wonderful organization, and I'm very grateful for this opportunity to, to talk about compassion and God's work in compassion. But first, I'd like to talk about why it's important. Uh, in Genesis 1.27, we learn that we are all made in God's image. We're all image bearers, all men, all women. So as the people that are image bearers, it's baked into our DNA to help and care for those in need. This is especially true of those of us who uh, know the Lord and who call God our Father. His heart breaks for the children broken and hurting. We can't help but for our hearts to break as well. So what does the Lord require of us? With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come with him, before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with one thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? Micah 6, verse 6 to 8. Justice, kindness, and mercy. Walk humbly with your God, just like the song that Bo and uh, the worship team sang earlier. So we recently learned in the book of Nehemiah, it's not what we're doing necessarily as much as it is who we're doing it for that's important. And so Nehemiah was faced with tremendous opposition in rebuilding the wall. And the opposition of extreme childhood poverty and the need for Jesus all over the world is very evident today. So Nehemiah teaches us that God's people walk in fear of the Lord, not what they won't have or can't have. They walk in fear of the Lord. If you faint in the day of distress, your faith is weak. That's Proverbs 24.10. Bottom line, we trust God and we act just like Nehemiah did. So what does that mean to us today? What's that look like? There's over 2,000 verses in the Bible that address poverty and the poor. If you've ever seen extreme poverty close up, you know it's evil, and you won't likely forget it. It undermines, it undermines all the good things that God instills in the living creatures. It robs people of their dignity. Uh, it ro robs them of the quality of life and sometimes life itself. There are places in this world where mothers don't name their children until they're two years old. And that's because 50% of them don't live that long. They call their children Habanyar Ramana. Habanyar Ramana means little gift from God. And it's actually a, a name that one of our compassion alumni has retained through the years. Uh, his name is Peter Habanyar Ramana. He's in his 40s, he's an attorney, completely educated by compassion, obviously a compassion child, and he retains that name, uh, through, and he has throughout his, his life. So children living in poverty, extreme poverty, they lack critical resources for food, water, critical care, medical care, family, community. They lack all of these things. Um, and in the words of, of <clears throat> Richmond Wandera, who we're going to hear from in a moment, um, poverty is a lack of choice. It can be daunting to look into the face of this monster, this world poverty that we're facing. And you, you might be tempted to say, like anybody would, what can I do? I'm one person. You know, how can I impact this huge problem in the world? But the Lord doesn't desire to guilt us, but he desires to empower us 
And as children of God, we have his nature in us. So we also, we also have this incredible power that Robbie referred to of compassion. So maybe you're wondering, how do I make a difference? How, what do I do? The compassion that you have, fueled by the Holy Spirit, will give you that desire and the courage and the strength to make an impact on the problem. So why children? Why do we choose children to focus our attention and efforts on? I mean, after all, they don't have a lot of money. They don't have any social standing. They don't have any thing of value to offer the world and they aren't yet uh, leaders and uh, doctors and respected economists there's five reasons that we choose children to focus our attention on first they matter to Jesus for me that's pretty much enough I don't even need the other four what do you yeah I mean if they matter to Jesus they matter to me right but there are many stories in scripture about how precious children are to Jesus. One of which is uh, in Mark 10, 13 to 15, where he shares of a time when Jesus corrected his disciples for keeping children from him. He said to them, the disciples, let the little children come to me and do not hinder such as these. I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. Second, Children are the most receptive to the gospel. We read in Proverbs 22, 6, Train a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not turn from it. Number three, there's a lot of them. There's 689 million children living in extreme poverty, which is defined as less than $1.90 a day. Fourth, they're hardest hit by poverty's effects and the least able to do anything about their circumstances. They're also most susceptible to malnutrition. Five, they have a lifetime ahead of them and potential lifelong change. Okay, we've discussed why we should focus on children. Now let's get to the how. One of the most potent weapons against poverty is helping a child see themselves as precious and valuable in the eyes of God. When that's paired with the nutrition, hung, uh, tutoring, uh, medical care, vocational training, the result's a tangible and sustainable impact. That's the difference you can make when you sponsor a child with compassion. You'll also connect them with a local church and care to, in, in, in their community that will help them with their walk and expose them to the gospel and help them with their walk in Jesus. So, if you would, with me, let's watch this video of Richmond Lombera. When I was eight years old, my father was taken away from us, and by that I mean he was murdered. Nothing was the same for me. News began to come to our doorstep. From our landlord, we got word that we couldn't stay in the house that we stayed anymore because we couldn't afford it. My mother had no job. My father was the only breadwinner. We moved from where we stayed to a place called Naguru Kasenke, which is one of Uganda's largest slums. And then I was introduced to our new home, which was a 12 by 12 room. I looked up on the roof. It was a tin roof that had holes in it. I've been to places where when it rains, people are happy. They get excited. But for me, growing up, whenever it rained, that was a night that we would stay standing. Get little buckets, place just where the halls in the roof are, and wait until morning. A reality hit me that day. This was life. I remember when my mom said to us, there was no money for food. That ushered us into a place where we were now going to begin to go to the street to fend for food. Hunger began to set in, lack of water. I was a kid, I, 
I didn't have time to be a child anymore. As I lived like this on a daily basis, poverty began to speak to me as a child. I felt I was nothing. I didn't matter. Nobody cared to know my name. I think the best way I could describe who I was and what I thought is the word hopeless. My mother, in tears, uh, approached one of her friends just to share with her friend. And her friend shared with her about compassion. Compassion staff members immediately came to our home. Uh, I remember them coming with uh, just uh, files to, to, to get details of who we were, what our story was. I got the news that a young lady, Heather, she was 15 years old, a teenager. She had decided to sponsor me. I cannot find the words to describe the joy that filled our home when we got the news. Richmond, you've got a sponsor, which means you can now go back to school. It means food will be given to us because of you. I began to walk into that reality that ushered in me an opportunity to rekindle this hope that was taken away. Heather began to write to me, to hear words like, Richmond, I love you. Richmond, I'm praying for you. They began to bring healing into places that were destroyed by voices and poverty and my self-image. I remember my day, June the 3rd, 1996. I walked forward to accept the Lord Jesus in my heart. I began to feel, wow, I have been released from poverty. I have been released. God began to continue to grow the leadership within me. And then I felt fully called to pursue pastoral ministry. I began the Pastors Discipleship Network, a ministry that exists to train and equip pastors. And I spend a lot of my life training and equipping pastors in the Word of God. Looking back into my life and thinking where I am right now and what I'm doing, I don't think any of this would have been possible without compassion. Compassion works. Everything that was placed within the program has helped build me to who I am right now. Poverty is not just the lack of money, the lack of material, food and water. Poverty is in, it's deep. I credit a lot of how I feel now about myself to those letters that I received from my sponsor. My name is Richmond Wandera, and I was released from poverty in Jesus' name. good fortune to work uh, with Richmond on a couple of occasions and Ron and I have worked with many of the uh, past uh, sponsored children and alumni and they're, they'll all point to one thing as their uh, saving grace so to speak and that's Jesus their walk with Jesus and through compassion uh, they were afforded that opportunity so what makes compassion so unique why is compassion a unique ministry We've got 2 million, 2.2 million children in the programs, um, and we've got been, been saving children from poverty over 70 years. We've worked with over 8,000 frontline churches in 29 countries, the 29 poorest countries of the world. Many of you are sponsors um, and have experienced the joy of changing a life uh, in Jesus' name. Ron and I have been sponsors for many years. We've had, had four for a long time, and then our oldest, Ronnie, in Kenya, graduated from high school last September, so we're, we're uh, at three right now. Uh, our children are in uh, Uganda, Kenya, and Mexico. Uh, compassion is a, a three-chord approach to ministry. First, we're Christ-centered. Second, we're church-driven. And third, we're child-focused. 
each individually taken each individually these would not be make us unique as a ministry but put together with our statement of faith and who we serve how we serve and where we serve makes us a very unique ministry we're christ centered we help the poorest of the poor the children in the greatest need in the world without any ulterior motives we're a love thy neighbor ministry Every child, regardless of their circumstances or their location, gets the gospel brought to them in an age-appropriate manner in their tongue or their language. They walk with Jesus through the pastor of a local church. That's the key differentiator. Since 1952, Reverend Everett Swanson started Compassion in 1952 in the war-torn Korea. Uh, Compassion has been saving children from Poverty in Jesus' name. And Jesus' life, his teachings, and all his character shape our programs in every aspect of the ministry. So back to that question of how Nehemiah responded to the opposition. How does compassion respond to a world filled with hundreds of millions of children in extreme poverty? We respond... We love like Jesus did. We love like Jesus did. Because Jesus is our core, and everything we do is meant to reflect God's heart. We love God. We demonstrate our love for him in everything that we do in all of our programs, everything, all the care that we extend to the children in our programs. This way of living is modeled for them. And the teaching of Jesus to love God and to love our neighbors as ourselves. We're church-driven. We do all our work through partnerships with local churches, over 8,000 of them at this this point, all denominations. But if we don't have a church to sponsor the center, the Child Development Center, we don't build it. No church, no center. Most of the churches are under the same roof as the center. Occasionally it's they're down the road a little ways, but not far. A frontline church is best suited to help a child acclimate to the local community, learn and, and learn about Jesus, and effectively deliver that message to that child in the local church. Just an example of some of the familiar countries that you might think of. For, for instance, um, in El Salvador, we've got 70,788 children, 270 churches that are serving there for 46 years. Mexico, 67,625 children, 222 churches. Kenya, 134,585 children, 473 churches. We're child-focused. When a child's registered in the Compassion Program, they are the beneficiary of the sponsors, donations. Yes, your family members and caregivers might receive ancillary uh, help from Compassion, but the primary result is to benefit that child. Singular, one-on-one sponsorship. Changing the life of the child isn't something that can be passive, though. You have to step up and act. As we learn in 1 John 3, 16 to 18, This is how we love Jesus. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down ourselves, our lives, for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth thing is, when you choose to sponsor a child with compassion, it's not just to benefit the child. It benefits you as well. We find hope. We find ourselves. Isaiah 58.10 says, If you spend yourself on behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness, and your night will become like the noonday. We give of ourselves on behalf of those in need. The light of Christ hope of Christ shines in and through us in a profound way. This way of living, spending ourselves, is the antidote to that disease of self 
focus that we talk about every week here at C3 and that we battle every single day on an individual basis. Lord, break my heart for those that are hurting. We have a unique opportunity today just at Compassion Sunday to speak up on behalf of those precious children living in poverty. In the words of, of St. Teresa, Christ has no body but yours, no hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes through which he looks compassion on this world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands through which he blesses all the world. Yours are the hands, yours are the feet, yours are the eyes. You are his body. Christ has no body now on earth but yours. I like to say if your heart belongs to Jesus, well, your hands and feet too, too. If you can come and visit the sponsorship table, you'll see the faces of these children that are in extreme poverty. And if you are so led and you choose to sponsor a child, you're providing a lifeline to a local church, but also nutrition, medical care, tutoring, all the opportunities to learn a trade and to, to prosper in life. So if you are and you uh, choose to prayerfully consider sponsoring a child, you will change a life forever. Jesus said, Anyone who welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. Please watch this short exit video. <laughs> when an opportunity of changing the life of one child is presented, our job as the body of Christ is to respond the same way that Jesus responded introducing them to Jesus, introducing them to the everlasting love of God. If you're thinking about sponsoring a child, I would say act. Because for me, when my packet was picked up, it was not just a packet. My sponsors picked me. And with faith in Christ, my life was forever changed. And you can do that too. Father, we trust the design of your plan, made in your image, to care for those in need, particularly those children who live in extreme poverty. Father, we pray that your church would instill the hope of Christ in these children and grant us open eyes, open minds, open hands, and open hearts so that we can be continually your hands and feet here on earth. May you bless us with the right resources along with a spirit of generosity, kindness and humility, and compassion. And be willing to trust you and take action. Lord, may you break our hearts for what breaks yours. We pray that you will stir hearts like only you can to make a difference and change a life through sponsorship and compassion.